thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us, especially our guests. Thank you. Uh, as always, we like to start off by just acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we're all on. We want to acknowledge our ancestors and those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We also want to acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we continue to stand on as we do this courageous work. So I want to welcome our esteemed guests, both Lise and uh, Mr. Head Wellington. So uh, if we could just have you both introduce yourselves and the remarkable work that you're doing, and we'll start with you, Ms. Lise. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a big pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Lise Birikundavi. I'm the co-founder and managing partner at BKR Capital. Um, we are a venture capital firm based in Toronto and focused on investing in Black-led tech startups. And in terms of my own background, um, I've been I've been in the financial industry, I think, for my whole career, starting in hedge funds and then doing funds of funds and direct investments, both uh, here in Canada, but also internationally. Always has been passionate in trying to find uh, clever and sustainable ways to increase representation and to make sure that we were uh, empowering our community economically. So um, this is uh, more than work. It's a passion for both myself and my co-founder. You can hear that most definitely. Thank you so much for sharing. Mr. Wellington, can you introduce yourself to everyone as well? Uh, sure. And when, when you when you say Mr. Wellington, I keep looking around for my father. So, Craig, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Yeah, so Craig Wellington, and I, I'm privileged to lead Black Opportunity Fund, which is a national Black community-led charitable organization whose focus is social economic empowerment of Black Canadian communities. And we do this in a number of ways by facilitating convenings uh, in our focus areas, which are health, uh, criminal justice, arts and culture, entrepreneurship, um, and, and, and education and youth and, and, and so on. And we've also been broadly looking at uh, housing and the implications of that on a number of outcomes for, for Canadians. Um, so we source needs-informed capital streams to flow to Black communities, to Black uh, entrepreneurs in the form of grants. We've set up a micro-lending program for Black entrepreneurs who have been declined lending by Canadian banks. We've partnered with a number of organizations to provide capacity building to help um, uh, in terms of business intelligence, in, te in terms of financial planning, marketing, um, accounting, all, all of that in partners, partnership with such as Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce, Afro-Caribbean Business Network. And while they're enrolled in the programs, we provide funding, non-repayable funding on a quarterly basis for for their investment in 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 the betterment and improvement of their organization, um, we provide grants to black led um, not for profits and charities as well, and we are preparing to launch a, a fifty million dollar private equity fund that will be focused on um, investing in in black led businesses and also a fund of funds to partner and invest in other. Black VCs, hello, Liz. Um, as well as we will be also looking at launching a similar size fund that will be focused on housing and creating pathways to home ownership for Black uh, Canadians. We've recently launched um, uh, funding support for certifications, licensing, and permits for Black entrepreneurs as they're enrolled in capacity building as well. So. Well, that's remarkable. Definitely some necessary work. So we appreciate the work that both of you are doing for our community. I know we were expecting uh, Deepo to be on this uh, panel as well, but he's uh, fallen ill. So our prayers are with him. And hopefully we'll be able to cover even more uh, with you two today. Uh, I'd like to start off with you, uh, Lise. Uh, as the first Black-led VC fund in Canadian history, what approaches and strategies have you taken to build your portfolio of companies so far? You know, I think that we're in a situation that is extremely particular because venture capital is risky in nature, right? Where uh, you have to basically sometimes go on the edges and be, be ready to fail hard, but just because you want to have, you want to invest in that next, you know, big thing. So, you know, we're, we've, I've been in the venture capital ecosystem for quite some time and 
there's always a bit of edge thinking. How do you become a bit futuristic? You know, like the first people invested in Airbnb, first people invested in Uber. How do you basically see how where the the where life is going and sort of try to be there first, but also means that you might really fail intensively. Um, because of the nature of what we're doing, because we the, the, our, our whole value proposition, the way we were looking at it is, you know, we don't see ourselves as an impact fund. We feel that investing in Black entrepreneurs is good business. There's so much talent in our, in our community. So it's not just sort of thinking, hey, we want to help people. It's not about helping. It's about investing in good entrepreneurs and investing in underrepresented entrepreneurs that have the possibility of giving as much or more financial returns than what you would see in mainstream, um, the, in the mainstream venture capital industry. Um, but we found ourselves sometimes maybe taking a little bit less risk on the edge cases because we really want to make sure that we're successful. There's this, I guess it's a bit of that burden of being the first and having such a strategy that you know um, that a mistake that could be done by somebody else and would be forgiven very easily cannot necessarily be done by you. So, so we're being very strategic. Every time we're investing in a portfolio company, we have a big understanding as to why we're doing it. You always have it. You know, you always have basically a value addition plan. You always have, you know, an exit plan when you invest in a portfolio company. But for us, it's, uh, you know, we're looking at so many data points before making those decisions um, because we understand what it means. So, so that that's basically what, I guess would be a bit different than what you would look at for traditional venture capital funds. Um, but we've been extremely fortunate. We've looked at, you know, well over, you know, a thousand decks since we started and we're invest. you know, we, we are what I could call a, a value driven venture capital fund. We don't do spread pray. It's not as, you know, you have small funds that have hundreds of portfolio companies. We don't do that. It's high concentration where we're looking to be a partners for growth, you know, we're in the trenches with our entrepreneurs. So that means that we won't have, you know, that many portfolio companies. We have 12 portfolio companies to date. We're looking at having a maximum of 15 for that first fund. And, um, but, you know, we're sector agnostic. We've invested in a cybersecurity firm with two fintech companies in the B2B SaaS in the art space, uh, in, a, you know, in HR tech. So it's, you know, it's quite varied, but, you know, what is extremely common amongst our port our founders is that failure is not an option for them. I think you would speak to all of them and you would see the same hunger in their eyes in terms of how they're going to make it and make it big, which is extremely excited, exciting to um, sort of witness and to support. Um, so, so I guess that's basically how we're looking at it and how we're building our portfolio. Um, again, maybe something else that would be different between us and mainstream VCs is that, you know, we came into this because we saw an opportunity, but also because we also, we care. It's it's our community, right? So we have to say no many more times than we say yes, unfortunately, but sometimes we're in front of amazing entrepreneurs, but we know it's not the right fit for us. So we will also try to support. If ever I see, you know, I speak with a corporation that has a specific need and I would have, that a company is working on that, even though they're not in my portfolio, I will always try to make that connection because the way I see it is, you know, Every Black entrepreneur's success is our success. What we're looking at doing in the long run is to make sure that we are eliminating that problem of being underestimated as a community, right? So it doesn't have to go through our portfolio. It's it's basically through the work that we're all doing. Absolutely. That Well, that's amazing. That's exciting to hear. Uh, I can hear the excitement in your voice. Uh, I love that you're, like you said, working on quality and the concentrated um, solid number to start. So we appreciate that. Thank you so much for sharing. And Craig, if you could just uh, articulate what your personal mission and vision is, and maybe a little bit more about the BOF Capital that you've launched. Yeah, I mean, my my focus is very much in line with what Black Opportunity Fund is, which is about um, social economic empowerment of of Black Canadian communities. But we have to really unpack what that means. I think my understanding, the, the way I always look at it is we can't just look at transferring money. We have to look at transferring power if we're going to dismantle and interrupt systems. So this is about where is the control? And, you know, Lise has articulated it beautifully in terms of their investment thesis, what the approach is, 
and that the focus is on essentially wrapping around understanding that these businesses can't fail. Um, you know, the reality is um, when you're in the venture venture space, a significant amount of businesses are going to fail. That's that's the reality. Um, a significant amount of businesses fail regardless. But how do we create the best opportunity recognizing that Black communities, because of systemic racism, have disproportionate access to, for example, the Bank of Mom and Pop, the disproportionate access to generational wealth through home equity, because of that disparity in, in the, the home ownership wealth gap, which is what people use to be able to invest in businesses, to be able to invest in education and, and, and so on. I was in the, the States the other day and I was, you know, interestingly talking to organizations in the States where I gave them a statistic that is, it, it should be frightening. The disparity between black and, and white home ownership rates in the US is the same today as it was in 1963 when it was legal to segregate. Um, based based on race. So black university educated people have the same home ownership rate as white high school educated people. So what does that mean? That's where the wealth gap is. It's not the 80 cents on a dollar and other things. So we have to take this holistic approach. So everything I do is about that holistic of it. It's always about the holistic approach. It's looking at downstream and how do we address the people who are drowning but also at the same time looking upstream and how do we stop people from falling in the water? How do we educate people? How do we teach them to swim? So that's why, uh, again, this that the approach by Black Opportunity Fund is to look at a holistic approach. It is to look at um, a whole community approach, Canada-wide, all the various intersectionalities of Black Canadian communities. We are looking at, if we're looking at entrepreneurship, we're looking at grants, we're looking at capacity building, we're looking at loans, and now we're looking at at, at equity and it's a whole community approach. Then we're also looking at that home ownership piece to create more equity. So we create a bigger pool of, of applicants that can flow into you know BKR capital and their pool and 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 and, and so on. So in we are going we're industry agnostic. We are going to be doing a blend of of a venture as well as growth because there's a number of 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 of, organ, of black led companies that are looking to scale that are doing fantastic work that are looking for our capital to help them scale and then we have the need um for the early stage companies to invest with and and and, and we will be looking at in terms of our thesis that's where we will be looking at working with other black VCs to to invest in partnership um and a fund of funds approach in those uh, equity and equity investments to help help them to help the, the the other black VCs scale. So that will be our approach um, to help as many companies as possible. But what we also recognize is the work that we are doing in the other aspects of our of, of our business lines are creating an ecosystem of support for black entrepreneurs in order to widen that pool. Well, we definitely appreciate the holistic approach. I think it's very necessary to look at all areas the way you have. So thank you for that. Uh, Lisa, uh, what primary gaps in capital that uh, BKR is addressed right now um, as a way for Black entrepreneurs across Canada to get ahead? I think that um, first and foremost, and I, I and I don't think this is something to be taken lightly, but it's representation, right? Um, you know, we're in a lot of rooms where others, where they've never seen people like us having the same discussions, right? We, um, you know, we participate in a lot of mainstream events and we make sure that our entrepreneurs are there as well, so that people understand. We create a, amazing syndicates of investors around our entrepreneurs. So it's not just us investing. One of our metrics of success is to basically see who else can invest alongside us. And to sort of put our invest our entrepreneurs in front of other investors and have them be as excited as we are. And they don't have our metrics. So they don't necessarily care about, you know, they do to a certain extent sometimes, but it's more about the business itself. But they hadn't seen that business before. And they're like, okay, let's do it together, right? So you're sort of creating that visibility, that change in mindset. And that is, and the whole goal is that, you know, it's those building blocks that creates 
um, openings and that will change how the, the how the ecosystem operates. When you think about the private investment ecosystems, it's trillions of dollars, right? That goes into companies in North America. So we need to, but people keep on saying they don't see black founders because it's not the same networks. So it's about how do we make sure that people start seeing them and that we're speaking the same language, that it doesn't look like it's concessionary, that we're not, you know, it doesn't look like it's about, oh, we need to do that because it's the right thing to do. No, we need to do that because they're good entrepreneurs, right? Like we were seeing what they're building and want to be part of that story. Like, and we want to create those success stories so that they look around and they're like, how did we miss this deal? So that's, that's really the whole goal that that representation piece and working at it on different levels. Not only are we investing in what, what I consider in amazing entrepreneurs, but we also um, have the BKR VC fellowship where we teach uh, the basis of venture capitals, venture capital to mid-career professionals so that we can place them into a mainstream VC firms so that they can also bring the benefit of their network and increase that visibility as well in those firms. We, uh, so we do a number of events, as I mentioned earlier, where we're tr we're trying to make sure that you know people start inviting our companies or ourselves to talk about other stuff than DEI, so that you know you talk you invite basically our biotech company to have an understanding of their groundbreaking product that they're building, you know their opinion on the latest science, and not talking about what it is to be a black entrepreneur. So then, if the more you start doing that, the more you start normalizing diversity the more you start bringing dollars into our community. So this piece of representation is really at the core of everything that we're doing, because the goal is that we stop having these conversations eventually because the problem is solved, right? Absolutely. Representation is just the beginning. And like you said, it becomes a uh, normal, so you don't have to focus on that. So yeah, we definitely appreciate that focus. Uh, Craig, can you share what kind of challenges or barriers you face in your work and what you and your team are doing to overcome them right now? Well, I mean, one of the biggest challenges most of us face is um, there was a spike um, following George Floyd. All of a sudden, Black people were seen. And as I, as I say, Black was in season. Um, but seasons change. And to be frank, we are seeing that significant pushback so it, it hasn't just stopped the spike, it has pushed back. And we've seen that with black um, venture capital firms that have been looking to invest in black female founders who are being taken to court in the US. We are, we are seeing that in affirmative action uh, programs being struck down across the US and educational institutions that even have affirmative action statements or diversity uh, departments um, are losing their funding. That is a reality. Much of um, uh, supplier diversity initiatives in the U.S. Uh, was recently there with a, a, a number of, of great uh, Canadian Black community leaders on an exchange tour with the U.S. State Department talking to Atlanta Airport, largest airport in the world, $6 billion procurement, um, University of Pennsylvania, uh, it, they operate the university and five hospitals. So they have many minority procurement targets, but they're no longer able to track disaggregated race-based data. They can't track how many procurement opportunities are going to black or Latino businesses because of the change in the environment, in the political environment. And in Canada, you know, we, we usually cheat and borrow disaggregated data from the U.S., and extrapolate. So what that means is we're no longer able to do that. So that environment is changing. So we're operating in a different environment where that funding that would have flowed three years ago or so on is drying up. So the relevance is a big, a big uh, piece of that. So how you get around that, and that's exactly what Lisa's is talking to, is the value proposition. So because what you're not what you're doing is less and less you, 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 you being able to appeal to people's uh, empathy and say, give this because it's the right thing to do. You have to make a business case for it. And these are good investments, right? And what we, we see is because of the barriers to Black entrepreneurs and diverse entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs um, 
to get into business, to get access to capital because of the barriers they have to face. By the time they get to that stage, they're better businesses because they've had to prove themselves so much. So much of the time, they're actually better investments. So being able to tell that story um, and to, again, as, as, as Lee says, introduce them into um, other potential funders who aren't in their network, right? Who, who aren't looking for that. When they're looking for investment opportunities, they're looking in the same places. They're looking in the same networks. They're, they're looking in the same golf, golf courses where they play. Um, and opening up the opportunity uh, is one of the most powerful things that we can do and introducing people into opportunities for capital that wouldn't have been there before. Because um, a lot of what we're talking about, these barriers, we call it unconscious bias. You don't know what you don't know. You know, they say this is 70% of, of white Americans, or white Canadians have a completely white social circle. So, so our businesses are operating outside of that, outside of the fringes. So no matter how good the idea you are, if you don't have access to the capital, and then once you get access to the capital, to procurement opportunities, right? You, you, you have less of a chance for success. So addressing all of those issues and understanding the framework of the environment we're now working in. Absolutely. Yeah, we see the shift. And I think it uh, it really goes hand in hand with what Lisa's saying about representation mattering. So I can definitely see the connection. Thank you for laying that out for us, Craig. Um, Lisa, if you could share uh, some of the important challenges that need to be addressed for Black-led VC ecosystems to scale and thrive in Canada, what do you think needs to happen? What do we need to see change? Um, I think a better understanding of the venture capitalist ecosystem is really, really important, right? So um, historically, I don't think that a lot of um, people from our community have been exposed to the venture capital space. Venture capital is already extremely niche, no matter which community you're from. Um, it's just really hard to explain to like the average person what does a venture capital firm does. And the closest thing that basically has helped us in our career was the rise of uh, Dragon's Den and Shark Tank, which is has nothing to do with our job, but at least it's something closer. I feel like, okay, I sort of understand what you're doing, right? Um, but, you know, if you want to have more decision makers, more people who are deploying capital from the community, it's having more people who understand what it is. It's not, it's not a, an easy job. It's not a fun job. Um, it's definitely a meaningful one. But having people who are coming from, you know, who are, who are basically create like, bridging that knowledge gap um it is is really important because one of the thing that we that we felt was extremely important as as a firm from the get go is to get the credibility we deserve from the ecosystem so that we're not this cute thing right so that you know that you can speak to other firms upstream because we want to make sure our companies as they're raising they're taken seriously as well when they go fundraise afterwards, that it was just not just a, a check of sympathy to check with the same eyes as they would have if they would look at an opportunity so that we can speak the same language, that we understand why VC was created. VC was never created to, to basically um, uh, create equal opportunities to help businesses. VC is, a, is basically private dollars that are invested to, to basically invest in opportunities that will generate outsized financial returns. That's the only goal of venture capital, generate money, right? So then you have to basically have that language and basically tell people in the space that you're missing out on amazing opportunities, right? And not just saying that, but showcasing, you know, telling them where they are because otherwise it becomes just noise like the, the real money will not be interested. So you want to make sure that you're bringing those real dollars to the table. So if you want the Black venture capital to scale, I think it's about having more people who understand that so that we can basically get into those rooms and, and grow. But it's also for our entrepreneurs to understand. And I, I know it's tough because we're seeing so many um, sometimes mediocre examples that are getting tons of funding. But I think that our super strength and our superpower could be just to make sure that we're always better. 
that we really show that resilience that Craig was talking about. That even if others are like putting their feet on the table, that we know that we, you know, we always know that we have to work twice as hard. But if our competitive advantage is that we're looking at our business really and looking under the hood and we're like, wow, this is amazing. Then you will start convincing people who are giving, who are basically investing dollars for value to invest in you. And so, so I think that is our, I, I feel that this is our collective responsibility as, as, as fund managers to, to bridge that knowledge gap as, um, and as entrepreneurs as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I definitely think that people uh, are sort of scared off by what they're not aware of. And and as you said, the the shark's tanks is the most uh, relatable thing that they're aware of. Uh, so it's just the beginning for sure. So thank you for sharing with that. Uh, Craig, I know you mentioned a lot of different projects that you guys have uh, coming down the pipeline uh, in your introduction, but do you have a key set of priorities that you're working on now that you'd like to elaborate on a bit more? No, I think all of those are our priorities, and then they're all equal priority. Obviously, the 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 key key ones we're working on is getting those two funds launched. Um, the goal is by the second quarter. The challenge we have is we happen to be a charitable organization, so what we have to do in trying to set up two um, for profit vehicles, these funds is setting up a structure that that allows us to do this while protecting our charitable status. So that means that there's a, a bunch of lawyers that are talking at each other. So we have Miller Thompson and Tories um, ensuring that we have that structure in place, which means we've had a significant amount of uh, funding partners who have committed funds to us, which where we've had to tell them, hold on, because we're not taking the funds until we are sure that we have uh, a, a clear understanding of what are the tax implications, what are the li what are the potential liabilities and risks, what is the structure, uh, what is the compliance framework that we need to put in place. So that's one thing that we follow our strategy. Um, and in the meantime, we're doing other initiatives. And recently, we're very proud of the fact that we were the lead funder for um, the creation of the statue of Lincoln Alexander, the Honorable Lincoln Alexander, that was unveiled at Queen's Park in January on, on Lincoln Alexander Day, which is the first statue of a Black person ever erected in any legislative building in, in, in all of Canada. So, you know, just thinking about what is the legacy of that? What is the impact of that for a Black child who now walks into those spaces and sees themselves represented? So, and we have a, not, a, a number of, of, of those types of initiatives that we're doing that is really looking at systemic and structural change um, and, and legacy, um, recognizing that is all tied together because visibility is possibility. Um, but in terms of the, the, this, the venture space, um, you know, the key thing Lise, Lise talked about is that education, um, because you get one chance to make a pitch and understanding and preparing our businesses that it's, it's, it's one thing to have a great idea, but you need to be able to pre present it in a way that resonates with the individuals who have the money and resonates with what they're looking for so you can make a case for the money. So making sure they're prepared for that, knowing again that there's already a reticence against investing in black businesses. We know that there's a reticence of investing in women-led businesses. So Black women-led businesses have that intersectional challenges that we have. How do we prepare our businesses to know um, how to present, how to get ready in terms of your pitch decks? And all of that is stuff that we that we have to provide. You know, So we, we have to offer more than just money. And, um, and again, the uh, BKR is an is a, uh, incredible example of, of that. And we have partnerships with other kind of incubators like BFN, Black Founders Network at University of Toronto and Fosa Abano and um, the work that they've they've done there, Tribe Network out of, out of Halifax. So again, we've provided funding and capacity support there as well. And we continue to look at collaborative opportunities with uh, other uh, Black-led organizations, Black-serving organizations who are doing tremendous work. 
um, and, and, and how do we help build their capacity and how do we collaborate with them? That's, that's kind of our laser focus. Absolutely, we appreciate that. Uh, Lise, can you share some of the learnings and actionable insights uh, that you've come across as the co-founder and managing director of BKR Capital? Sure, but there's something that Craig said that you know really uh, resonated. You know this uh, this this um, power of well, we discussed that before. Power of representation, but more than just through us, but you know through every single thing we sort of build or contribute to in our ecosystem, like the statue, for example, is it seems small, but it's really big, right? And this is basically what allows the next generation to recognize themselves. And this is possible because you have people from a certain community that are you know, the ones that are deploying the assets, deploying the dollars and know what's important, right? Um, we have a similar example, not to that same extent, but you know, when we, we have an office in Montreal and it's beautiful co-working uh, space of all venture capital firms. And uh, when we were about to sign these Carly's documents, we look at the plan and it's city, it, it's basically, in, each room is name of cities from all around the world, like literally, all around the world, except for any black countries, whether it's in the Caribbean, whether it's in Africa, but literally everywhere else, right? Australia, every, like lots of cities in Asia, Middle East. And so, you know, we're, we're like, before even we signed, we're like, oh, that's super interesting. That's a comment we made, right? And I'm sure nobody noticed because, you know, the staff there is, ex and, and management, extremely nice, super welcoming. But this is something that was really important to us, and we really had that conversation with them. And today, there's um, three African countries that are represented. So you have like Nairobi room, you have the Lagos room, and you have Cairo. And just that for somebody coming in makes a big difference because then you have you know greater representation. I'm still working on Kingston, <laughs> but you know it's just to make sure that it's really complete. But it's it's just it's small stuff. It's small stuff that whenever you come somewhere, you feel like you represented like you belong in you know a certain way. Or if it's not there, like you don't belong, right? Um, so yeah, and and I hope that we'll have uh, many more of those those examples as you know all of the entrepreneurs in this chat become super powerful and super successful. That you can basically make sure that you're shaping the community in a way where every single one of us is comfortable. In terms of key learnings and um, actionable insights that we've learned, um, that's a very good question. You know, like we we see so many entrepreneurs on a regular basis, and sometimes, and and, and I've already shared that I think in some other panels, but I find that sometimes our community. Um, will not think big enough. You know, there's so much more than, 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 than Canada itself, than like the, the boundaries that we have. There's so, you know, sometimes you have somebody who will be super excited because they're making a hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Well, don't be excited because you need to make 10 millions. You need to make a hundred million, right? Or how do you get there? What's the next step? You know, like how do you be become a global success. It's not about building this thing on the side of your desk, which could be nice because everybody has their own, I guess, set of priorities, but having an understanding that it is absolutely possible for you to build that success story. If you choose not to, it's something else, but it is possible. There are means you can do it, right? So having that, having these types of a vision and, and knowing that it's possible and to, to be resourceful. It's not just looking up to venture dollars. Some people have built businesses without venture dollars, right? And that have been amazing successes. So the whole goal of going to a venture firm is not to basically be able to survive, is to help accelerate. But you need to have a plan where even if you're not receiving those venture dollars, you will still win because that's what you're here for. You know, you're, you're building your business and you will make sure this works because you understand your customer, you understand where to get the, you know, how to optimize your cost. Um, like you, you, you think strategically, you're resourceful and, um, and yeah, let, let, let not put ourselves limits that actually are not there, you know. Absolutely. Uh, we definitely have to look beyond that and, and not limit ourselves. So there's definitely enough against us, working against us already. So I do appreciate that. I think in the same time that we had um, this generation um, pushing to pull down 
a lot of statues, um, you know, across the city. It's great to see, as you mentioned, that the same uh, era we had uh, one erected with representation for our community. So I'm glad that you both did highlight that moment in history. Uh, Craig, can you share um, how you feel about the future of venture capital in Canada? And you're muted. Sorry, I'll, I'll figure out the technology by the next <laughs> pandemic. Um, yeah, I mean, we need to grow. I mean, there, we're still very nascent in terms of the venture capital ecosystem in Canada. And you see a lot of uh, Canadian businesses, a lot of Canadian uh, VCs are looking outside for investment, looking to the US, looking for whatever in terms of investment. So it is still very nascent. And as Lee says, that understanding of the, the venture space, um, there's still entities with a large amount of money who are reticent about about investing in uh, in, in 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 venture, uh, so but there are huge opportunities, and the more success stories we have, success begets success, and money follows money. So the more successes there are, the more successes that a VCare, a capital, and so on has, uh, will lead to more successes, and eventually we we'll break down these barriers and silos where people will get past their biases and just start investing in businesses and not look at what, you know, using their same difference algorithm to make a decision on the business based on the level of melanin of the of the individual in front of them or the gender of the or the religion of the individual in front of them. At the end of the day, um, there is an opportunity to make change. Um, and this is that representation piece by a BKR and some of the other VCs, black led VCs, entering to, into this space, the impact is more than just the businesses they are funding. The impact is more than just the businesses they're grooming. It is the very presence in this space and what that means in the same way the statue of Lincoln Alexander is now transformative. It is now changing the space. In the same way, you know, a woman taking a seat at a boardroom table or a black person taking a seat at a boardroom table that was uh, prior to that mostly white, um, uh, middle class, older males. Uh, and, and what is the domino effect and impact of that? So what we are seeing by the success of a VCR capital and by the intentionality of it and, and Black Opportunity Fund coming into a space like this, when people see, and we look at the response to, you know, we are now recruiting a managing partner for our investment vehicles. And when people see the intentionality of that, and they see Black-led, Black-focused people making these very independent um, uh, forays in, in, into these arenas, it signals a change. It signals a, a, a very significant culture change that we are taking up space. And that in itself is going to have significant impact um, all the way along, along the line. So uh, I'm hopeful. There's, uh, as, I, as I said, things have changed in the environment. There's there's pushback, but there's there's things that can't go back, that can't be pushed back. And, and we're here. We're not going anywhere. We are we're committed to taking up space. And most importantly, we're we're committed to reaching behind us and pulling people up with us. And that's not gonna, that's not gonna change. And when we go into those spaces, we're we're going in very intentionally and very unapologetically. I mean, we have our 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 slogan is we back black. Um that's very blunt. It tells you what we do, it tells you who we're about. Um and and we are we are we're we're here to take up space and we're not we're not begging anybody for anything we're not looking for handouts we are creating investment opportunities and we're inviting people who are intentional who are interested uh to invest in it and if they're not willing to do that for whatever reason that's fine we'll go find somebody else that is and we have that belief um and we're doing it in the in our in the right way 
and we are, you know, that's that's our intentionality, and we're engaging with community all the way along to ensure that we are meeting community needs, that we're responding to what the community needs. We're engaging with with black entrepreneurs all the way along because we understand that we're just stewards uh, of the black community. We're here representing. Um, and that that's it. That's it. So I'm, you know, very hopeful. Um, we're seeing a change. This is the this is the potential opportunity for there to be a real renaissance of in black entrepreneurship, and uh, we're we're happy to be a small link in a chain. Appreciate that. I want to see if we have uh, questions. I think I got note that we have a question from the audience. If uh, we could have. Morgan, unmute and state your question. Hi, blessed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Marlon Allen. Um, I appreciate the session today. Absolutely appreciate the opportunity to be here and to hear of all the wonderful things that are happening. Uh, my question is, um, you know, what does collaboration look like uh, for both the venture capitalist firms to advance the uh, venture, the Black venture capitalist um, ecosystem as well here in Canada. Is that for Lisa or Craig? Uh, whoever feels <laughs> they want to answer. You're feeling a tugging at your heart, please, uh, whoever is best able to answer, go ahead. I think that you know one of the first steps towards that collaboration, it's um, I think that as, as a collective, the creation of Black VC Canada as an organization is already a first step, uh, which is basically sort of re reuniting every, not everyone, but you know, I, I guess a big a majority of uh, the actors from our community in the space. You know, either you're professional in the venture capital space or um, you actually uh, are an entrepreneur in that space, like us, BKR, owning our own VC fund, but. Uh, I think that collaboration is also, you know, supporting each other in different ways. Uh, you know, there, there are several emerging fund managers in the space where uh, we have connected them with investors. So some of the first investors of two of the funds that, that are in Toronto have been uh, connected by BKR. So we, we don't see each other, as, each other as competition for us again. And I we definitely mean it nothing will change with only one actor deploying capital. And the whole goal is to normalizing diversity. So if there's a way of supporting each other in a way that will create more of us, that's what we will do. Um, so that so it's already happening. We're, we're all in communication. We're speaking to each other on a regular basis and uh finding ways to yeah to share. Sometimes you know it's about deal flow. You know, we're receiving um recommendations from others doesn't mean that it's a fit, but just the fact that we keep each other in mind on a regular basis already helps. Yeah, I I, I echo that and 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 yeah that shout out to Black VC is 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 well deserved because it is a, a community um that kind of helps to supercharge the the black um venture eco ecosystem. And yeah that 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 there is that collaboration already happening and everybody is sharing successes, sharing opportunities, sharing the deal, deal flow. Um, and, and by working together, we, we have more capital to invest, right? So that we're, it's not all going to come. The, the, the entire check is not going to come from any one of us. So we all have to work together. I know when we were looking at our thesis and looking at how we are going to do our equity investments. I mean, we made a decision to do that in a fund of funds way that we will do it in partnership with other black VCs, right? So that is, you know, that is part and parcel, parcel, ugh, part and parcel of our approach. It is embedded in it. It is baked into our approach is collaboration. And, um, you know, so we've, the, the success of BKR is something that we've always looked at. Um, and 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 others as well, and and cheered for their success. Um, That's great. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, we have one other question from Abby. Can Abby unmute and ask her question? Hi. Yes. Good afternoon. 
how are you guys doing? So my name is Abby. I'm a serial entrepreneur. So this is for any one of you guys. <laughs> As a black-led VC firm, what is the smallest and largest investment sizes or check sizes that you fund made to black companies in your portfolio? Did you guys hear that? Sorry, my background's loud, so. <laughs> you did. You did. Um, so the way we're structured is that we focus on pre seed to seed stage companies and the latest um, stage company that we will invest in um, for first check is, you know, like seed plus if you're doing a bridge between seed to series A and it's between 150,000 to 500k as a first check. But we do keep half of our investable uh, assets for fall one investments. So we have a few companies in which we have invested a little bit over a million dollars, for example. So it's, it's still on the smaller side if you're thinking about VC. Uh, but it's also because we're a smaller fund, a smaller fund we're managing twenty two million dollars. But that's how, but you know we're looking at most, for example, um, we've been able to leverage our capital sometimes by five times, you know, by bringing people around the table to also co invest with us. And, and that model that Lise is talking about is the model that we're going to follow. And we will be doing it again by looking at um, working with a BKR, working with the other other firms out there and saying, how can we bring capital together? Um, but, but using their working with their thesis as well and providing capital, co-invest opportunities and so on. So, yeah, very similar. Thank you. I think we thank you for your question. Uh, we had one come through the Q&A from Tiandra. She would like to know if Google is the best place to learn and understand the fundamentals of what's required to obtain funding. So where should they get uh, familiar with the process? I think that we there's a lot of um, very good accelerator program, depending on you know, if it's to also have support for your business, because that, there's a lot of resources on Google. You know, there's a beautiful book that's called Venture Deals that I think is the book that is the most um, famous in the venture capital space. So that's one that is worth reading. There's a lot of really good literature. If you Google it, there's, um, I, think, I think if you even go on the Venture Lab, uh, website there's probably a, a section for entrepreneurs i'm not 100 sure i'm pretty sure if you go on the y combinator website as well there's tons of information as well um so there's a lot of resources i would recommend reading about venture deals but i would recommend also being part of communities where they teach you about venture capital so we have a partnership with uh, dmz's black innovation program so we work a lot with them and um you know they've been in the space for if i'm not mistaken a little bit over 10 years and working with you know most of the major venture capital firms in Canada, so their accelerator their accelerator program is really good, and they have you know a stream for Black founders. So so it's it could be interesting to go and basically start learning from them. Uh, I think that Craig also mentioned a few additional sources of of you know support as well for the Black community, and most of them would have also um, you know information on the different type of or source of capitals that are available. Thank you. And so uh, we'll switch to Craig, if you want to give us your closing thoughts and whatever calls to actions you'd like to put out there for the ecosystem. Well, I think I think it's that that collaboration piece, I think, is important. Is you know, look for people who are already in the space, look for people who are where you want to get to and find a mentor find mentorship, find guidance, so you don't make the same mistakes others have made uh, and use up valuable time and, and resources. Um, and, and, and yeah, so it, a lot of people think money is the issue. Money is the issue, but the issue isn't money. You need, you need connections, you need mentorship, you need guidance and support. So share your plan share your, your 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 proposal with as many people as possible get insight in it um you know look at these accelerator pro programs um look at it as an opportunity to develop and and invest the time you know this is not easy work most businesses fail so what you want to do 
is as much as possible, increase your opportunities for success. And the way to do that is to find people who have information to share, who have who can connect you in to their networks and will help you um, uh, to build your capacity and increase your, your chances for success. So as much as possible, don't try to do it alone. Use the resources that are out there. At least just mention a bunch of them. There's tons of them out there. Um, there's there's more resources available now than there has ever been for Black entrepreneurs. And much of it is free. So use it, lean on it, find mentors, find people who are, 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 are where you want to get to and ask them to help you share their story and give you tips to avoid landmines and, and, um, and quicksand. Thank you so much. And Lise, do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action for the ecosystem? I think I think Greg said it all. <laughs> I really, you know, it's I think it's really about collaboration, right? Um sometimes we're put in this situation where um, you know, we almost feel like uh crabs in the bucket to a certain extent when the pie is so much larger than what you know everyone can see. And I really believe in our ability to um, basically deactivate, um, you know, the situations that sometimes the mainstream ecosystem is trying to put us into by really collaborating as, as a group, as a collective force, despite um, you know, the lack of interest on DEI, despite, uh, you know, what's happening at the south of the border uh, in terms of how, you know, some of you know, wonderful professionals have been, you know, evilized. And um, I think that if we stand together, that we decide to be excellent, that, you know, from a, from a you know, number standpoint, you know, the math is mathing, you know, and if, you know, we're not the ones that come in our own way, uh, we, we can get there. there there's, it doesn't have to be one or a few that are successful. I think that, you know, if we're trying to normalize diversity and, and making things change, it's really about how do we make sure that everybody gets to the finish line as much as possible. And, and often we're our biggest critics. Let's, let's make sure that we are our biggest supporters. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank both of you for taking the time to sit on this panel today. We really appreciate all the insights and especially the resources you shared um, to make this, uh, you know, accessible and relatable to our community. So thank you both so much for taking the time to be here today. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, participating, uh, and sharing as well. And as always, we like to close off the way we began by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we're all on. We also like to acknowledge our ancestors and those who toiled without compassion or compensation and our elders whose shoulders we continue to stand on as we do this work together for our collective liberation. So once again, thank you to our esteemed guests and thank you for everyone for tuning in.